Hello, hello professionals. My name is Rico Aladdin and I am the founder of Professional Lunch. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us. I have the mayor of the city of Fargo here in the studio at the Bison Information Network Studio. So, Mr. Mayor, it's so glad to have you on Professional Lunch today. How are you? Very good. Good to come out here and see what's going on. Wonderful, wonderful. Please tell us a little bit about yourself so that the Professional Lunch audience who doesn't know much about you can uh, learn a little bit more about who you are. So I come from a small town, Devil's Lake, North Dakota, where I was born and raised, and uh, went through uh, my professionals uh, training. I went to the University of Notre Dame, and then went to UND Medical School, went on to Tufts Medical School, mm -hmm. and then finished my residency training in Minneapolis at Hennepin County. Became a physician uh, surgeon in 75, and I've been practicing surgery for 46 years. Wow, wonderful. So you are a surgeon. And right now, so whenever I think about it, I usually uh, talk about the professional life first, you know, as a doctor. Tell me a little bit about your background. How did you decide on your major in school? Because that's why we have the show here, so that students can learn from experience of accomplished professionals such as yourself. So when I was in uh, high school, or excuse me, college, mm -hmm. as I went through my college years, every summer I would take a different job. Wow. And I kid my kid, I tease my kids, but I did 22 different jobs in my college career, different wow. jobs and different things. I was in a survey crew, worked in the post office, worked construction, drove a cement truck, uh, did a variety of different things, uh, worked in maintenance for a hotel, uh, different jobs and different ideas. And my dad was a family practice doctor in the community, so I considered that. But one of the things that struck me, and this will be hard for you to believe, okay but I was paid $2.10 an hour when I worked construction. Wow. <laughs> and I turned to a guy who'd been there 20 years and I asked him how much he was making and he was making two ninety. And I said, you know, I'm not sure I'd like to work 20 years and be making less than three bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. And he was raising six kids. So you just begin to think about, okay, if I go into different career paths, what kind of income might I get and what can I expect to for my family and myself? Mm -hmm. Um, I liked medicine because I felt it was very, you can have an intimate uh, discussion with somebody, relationship with them. Uh, you can take their appendix out, very uncomfortable for them. They feel better when they're done. And it's, it's a unique relationship, but it, it's uh, an end goal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I come into something wrong, I fix it, you get better and you go on with your life. Mm -hmm. And I just, I liked that more. That was appealing to me. So when I was in my college years, I went into pre-professional and decided to elect to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, knew kind of from my father's background what that was like, but elected not to do family practice. I liked the surgical part because I thought I could fix something and get you better. Mm -hmm. And then something to do with your hands, it's very uh, tactile. And so I've enjoyed that. That's, it turned out exactly what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I would say to many young people, yeah, find out what you want, because I have other people that have gone through medicine and not been happy when they got done. So whatever it is that you really like, I think you should pursue. Mm -hmm. My daughter wanted to please me. She wanted to say, well, I'll become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she came with me one day when I was working in the office. Mm -hmm. She walked in the first patient's room, we sat down, she fainted. <laughs> I hadn't even asked a question. <laughs> So then we uh, went along and I said, okay, get some water. Let's see what happens. We walk into the second patient's room. She faints. I said, you know, I don't think this is going to work for you because you can't faint every time you see a patient. Yeah. She went on into marketing and has done very well, that very successful. But it, it's something that you need to maybe job shadow, see if you'd like it. There's a variety of different careers in medicine people could like or not like. Mm -hmm. And or I think everybody should try out a profession, see if they like it, get involved with some professional that's in it. So you don't get surprised when you get done and say, I didn't know there was so much paperwork or I didn't know there were so much people interaction that you have to do. And I was told by Dean Brashani that a lot of people change their majors five times. And I can understand that you have so many choices today. I mean, there's so many different things that you can do. And I, I think that's uh, something that's a, a great idea. Great thing in, in what's happened in modern times is choices are just so much more. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, wonderful. And you touch on something very interesting here, and that's why we have Professional Lunch. We want to bring the stories and experience of accomplished professionals so that uh, college students, early career professionals can make those decisions based on what they are learning from um, having this conversation. And so right now, you have a very interesting career as a surgeon. Uh, tell me how was the transition between being a surgeon and becoming a politician now? Well, it was an interesting challenge because I had never been in politics. I basically <laughs> had been medical politics, which is board of directors, those types of things, which are small groups and you don't have a big audience that you might make angry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, when I transitioned into politics, uh, it was interesting for me because then I had to become more extroverted and be careful mm -hmm. about choice of words and what you say that you might inadvertently insult somebody you didn't mean to. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to think about the effects of whatever legislation or what you do mm -hmm. because, and I, I'll go a simple example, uh, a neighborhood came together and wanted to pave their alleyways mm -hmm. and you're going to pave your alleyways. Now, 50% of them wanted it and 50% didn't want it. The ones that didn't want, just were, they liked the gravel alley, they went out with their cars, changed oil, did stuff, didn't have to worry about what they spilled on it, and were very much, uh, we want it the same way. And we had them stand up and speak very, very well, good speeches, and you say, yeah, I agree with that. You had the other part that wanted the alleyway, and they explained all the reasons they wanted it and it made logic. And it's sometimes trying to decide, okay, which makes more sense? Because mm -hmm. it was almost a 50-50 divide. And of course, we made the decision, and Mayor Wallacher at the time was sitting there, and he had to vote the vote that made them have a paved alley. And the lady stood up and said, I'll never vote for you again. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, that's kind of interesting. Um, what, what I found as I've been in this position is uh, people are wonderful. The community is wonderful. There's a lot of generous people in the community. A lot of people want to give and to help. There's a lot of passion in the community. Mm -hmm. and. You have to try to read that as what's for best interest of our community. Mm -hmm. What should I pay attention to and, and what do I need to know are the biggest drivers in the community of what we need to do as a great city. Mm -hmm. And it's different because in patient relationships, it's one-on-one. -on -one. I, I can make you unhappy as a patient, but it's just you and I that kind of know that. Yes. If you make your, your voters unhappy, they will respond either by voting you out or getting angry at you or doing something. So it's a different mindset that you have to begin to remember who you're, who you're talking to. And that was the transition I had to make is to transition to the bigger crowd and to the bigger amount of people. And at first, you're always very careful about every vote you do because you think, oh, you're, you're gonna, as a voter, gonna pay attention to every vote I take. Mm -hmm. And that's not really that that they pay attention to. They pay attention to Mark, what's in your heart. Are you sincerely trying to take care of the community? Do you have, quote, our best interests in mind? And I think that's the thing you begin to learn is that you have to, even though it may be on a popular vote, you have to vote what is best for all. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. So as a mayor now, uh, congratulations again on being reelected. And um, I know I, you know, I reached out and said that before. But uh, so tell me, what are some? What what is the role of a mayor in a city? Well, it's kind of interesting because if you meet uh, certain people, mm -hmm. uh, they. Uh, think you have a checkbook with $500 in it, <laughs> give checks out for whatever people want. Mm -hmm. But what you begin to learn is that uh, you're the ambassador for the city. Mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of the ambassador for what goes on. Yeah. And you have to carry a firm belief that the community is gonna have the direction you need. Um, we needed flood protection, so we needed the diversion. Mm -hmm. And that's hard two ways because you're upsetting homeowners, farmers, people that have been in the place for a long time and you're trying to build a project that protects the whole community. Mm -hmm. And you have to carry an immense amount of optimism. So if I turned to you and said, can you raise $3 billion in the next three years or four years? That's a huge task that you have to think about. How would I do that? Who would I talk to? And so what you find your role as a mayor is, one, you have to outline the problem, then two, you have to try to find a solution. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes for the community, you have to think outside the box. You have to think of different ideas. So when we started this project, we had state partners, federal partners, and we had local partners. We reached out to the city and citizens 
and ask them to vote in a tax. Now, what's unusual is we voted in a sales tax that goes to 2084. How many times would any population vote for a 50 year tax? It just is unheard of. Yeah. But the reality is the people wanted flood protection and they would do that. So oftentimes your role is articulating the problem and then giving the solution and trying to minimize impacts on everybody. Right. When I look at utilities and your water bill, I know that if I increase your water bill, that affects you. You know, and on average, a, a bill of water is 30 bucks. But you can't willy nilly just add five, 10, $15 to your monthly bill because that affects all your homeowners. Mm -hmm. And you have to think about your people on fixed income. How do they do and how, how are they going to fare if you keep raising, raising, raising? So you want to always think of keep the taxes low, run a good city with services that people appreciate, and at the same time be forward thinking. The one issue sometimes, and I'd love any of the students to get involved with this, is where do you want your city to be in 10 or 15 years? Well, how, do you, how do you want it to be? Friendly city, embracing city, a city that welcomes as new business, entrepreneurs, young people. Do we have the right mix of things for people to do? Are the parks good enough? Do we have recreational things to do? If you're raising a young family, do I have uh, different events that carry your interest that you might enjoy seeing? A lot more people are moving into apartments. We have to have events or things that you can go out with your children and do. So um, what I love is new ideas. So one of the things I learned as a student, as a doctor, always try to find new ideas and embrace them. So I would always be snoopy. I'd go into somebody else's operating room and see what they're doing, see the mechanics, see the total knees, see the different open heart surgery procedures, just to learn to see physically what it is. And what I love about young people is sometimes think different, have different ideas, and it generates uh, an interest by a variety of people. So for instance, a million cups, we had a million cups. In a million cups, people would come and tell their new businesses. And it was always fun to listen to. There's a lot of energy. But then what would happen is other businesses would stand up and say, how can we help you be successful? What can I do to help? And you know, if, if it's a, a trade or, or something, a product you're selling, obviously you can buy it. But there's other ways of getting word of mouth out, or this is a great place to go, or on social platform, getting it out. This is a great restaurant, try it out. And so it's how we all embrace trying to make everybody successful, or that all of us try to work together to help everybody with a hand up or a leg up to get going on something they want to do. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. And now we're going to take a short break here. When we come back, we'll talk to the mayor about some of the things that he loves about what he does. We'll be right back. This is uh, Mayor Timothy Mahoney. Did I say that right? You did. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we get to the part of the conversation where we talk about some of the things that you love about what you do. And uh, please tell me, what is your favorite thing, uh, part of being a surgeon? And after that, your favorite uh, part of being a, a mayor? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> So in surgery, the reason I enjoyed it so mm -hmm. much is I loved anatomy and kind of learning mm -hmm. parts of the body and what the body does. Mm -hmm. And then the resiliency of a, a person, uh, um, of how people can go through a variety of things. You know, you could have a young person in a terrible accident and if you just work to put all the parts back together, they could mend and get better. Mm -hmm. And early in your career, you're all excited about the mechanics of it. Uh, how do I do this and how do I make this work? How do I did vascular, how do I get this leg with blood flow again? And then as you go on your career, you get more into the psychological part of it. What does it take to get you to recover? What does it take to help you uh, generate the energy and the process of healing? So you realize uh, surgery is good, but it's also recovery from that surgery and how different people are motivated different ways and how to tie into that. So, you know, sometimes when I would ask questions, I'd want to know what was the person's motivation. So if you're operating on somebody 80 years old, you want them to want to recover. So what is it that sparks them? Their grandchildren, their children, some interests that they have, something else going on. And so I would learn that you use those as motivators. 
you got to get out of bed. You got to walk. It's going to hurt, but you got to walk. You got to do this. You need to do this. Your granddaughter Susie won't be happy unless you, you try to do that. So you begin to learn the psychology of surgery. And healing to me is, it was just a fascinating thing of how to, to motivate and help your patient get better. And as you know, we have uh, opioids, that's a big part of the problem is in, you used to have a part where you always have to have your patient smiling. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have them smiling with a slight frown because their pain might be totally taken care of, but it'll be better. But then we need them to get up and do the things they need to do. Mm -hmm. So you learn more as you went along the whole psychology of healing and you going into surgery. If I had to say, if you were a smoker, please stop smoking for two weeks. You know, mm -hmm. if you have different elements and you learn over time, what are the motivators for your patient? Transition into politics is, <clears throat> um, I used to do a mission trip to Haiti mm. and go down to Haiti and work one week and we'd go into a hospital. We'd do 50 surgeries and it would be stuff that's been neglected for a long time. So in America, a hernia might be just a little bulge that's hanging down. In Haiti, it'd be somebody 20 years with a hernia that is really hanging down. Mm -hmm. And so the satisfaction, I mean, they were very, very appreciative of us fixing them so then they could be more active and do the things they want. But my wife one time said, you only do that for one week a year. So don't you think you could do more in your community? Mm. I said, yeah, I probably could do something <laughs> more. Um, so I got into politics kind of as a, uh, there was a special election. I knew the guy running and they said, I think I could do as well as him. Mm -hmm. um, I'll run for commission. And when I first got in the commission, what I was told was, it was two hours every two weeks. So oh. no big deal. Mm -hmm. You can handle that. <laughs> But as time has gone on, the city has grown. So the city has continued to grow. So when I moved into town in 1980, the city had 60,000 residents. Mm -hmm. Now we have 130,000. So wow. all that has evolved. So what I really loved about being part of the political structure is what could I do to impact to help this community grow, get more jobs, get more ideas, have things happen. Um, how could we help the young people become successful? And it's fun being part of the uh, gel that helps to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So we're seen as a very progressive city. We're seen as a city that uh, attracts businesses, attracts number one job market in the United States two years ago. Mm -hmm. So we're doing something right that's attracting people. For young people, we have lower cost of living, but we have higher wages. So that's really helpful. People want to stay in the community. And what I really love is the variety of jobs we have. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that and you are finished with your degree, you have so many options in the community. And when I grew up coming from Devil's Lake, coming to Fargo, I mean, it used to be known that you would go away to school and come back or you'll go away to work. You'll go to Minneapolis, Chicago, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You might decide to come back to our community because we didn't have the opportunity. But now I have the same opportunities you can get in Chicago or Minneapolis in the community. And we have great business partners that are doing well. Mm -hmm. Aldevron is a company that helped with the virus, it made the RNA type of materials that were utilized to make the, the vaccines and to make the things that we need against that. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think a small company in our community could do that, but that's what happens. Agriculture is huge and what the NDSU does in the egg fields is it helps more farmers be more productive. Over a course of time, we have seen many, many uh, things done for the world comes out of this little town. And so I always uh, talk about you know Fargo and I used to get this, you know, they saw the Fargo movie and oof, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you come from that town with a wood chipper. And it's transitioned now to Fargo. Well, that's quite a community. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff going on in your space. So what I'm pleased about is we're now getting the reputation of being a forward looking city that's modern and does a lot of things that young people like and, and older as well. And is growing into a thriving community, many different restaurants, many different cultural events, many different things going on that we're not just a, a ma and pa type little town, we're now a big city. Wonderful. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on is, I wanted to know what is the city is doing specifically to keep the professionals, the graduate students, students that are graduating right now, you know, uh, in the city so that they can find opportunities because Fargo is growing and we have a shortage of workers and stuff like that. But we want, I would like to know, 
what is the city is doing specifically to help to keep talent that are graduating right now? So what we do as a city, we oftentimes will donate to different organizations to help us do that. Mm -hmm. So the Chamber of Commerce, and then there's the Economic Development Corporation, and then there's Fueling Our Future, all of those which focus on young people graduating and when they come out. Mm -hmm. We watch as those uh, elements help to recruit to help people come on board. Mm -hmm. In addition, the Workforce Academy, we donated to that so we could have people who didn't choose the colleges to have an opportunity to have a different career to grow that and have that go forward. We are part of a grant with the federal government which is $9 million, which is to help to retain and to hold on to our students in our community. And you'll see in the next year, many of the chamber events will surround how to, how to do that and how we're gonna move that forward. Mm -hmm. We recently hired a diversity, equity, and inclusionary director, <clears throat> Dr. Terry Hogan, we've met. Mm -hmm. And one of our goals with him is of how do we look at diversity in our community and equity, and how do we help to build a platform where people want to come and stay and work? And so that part is uh, in, inclusivity is some part of it. How do we get people to, to uh, feel part of our community? And the important thing that some people have to understand, it's not getting people to your community, it's it's getting them, I just gotta get rid of this. Yeah, that's okay. It's getting, it's not only getting people to your community, but it's retaining them. Mm -hmm. What you wanna be able to do is retain people in your community, and that means integrating them into everything that goes on. And I think you felt this as well, is mm -hmm. that how do I get involved in the community how to become a participant that actually causes some changes that are popular. Mm -hmm. And we're very committed to that. So oftentimes we'll do grants, we'll give money to the FM Foundation and have them distribute grants. We'll give money to United Way, see if there's other ways uh, in which pe we can help people. Yes, wonderful. And that's part of, part of the reason why I have professional lunch with uh, accomplished professionals. I want to give uh, less experienced professionals that window of opportunity to see what are other people are doing uh, in the community, how they are successful, show their success. You know, talk about their businesses, talk about their job, the opportunity that they have received in order for them to grow, uh, to stay here and grow in the community. And that's a very valid point. So, uh, you know, tell me, um, as the city, um, how is the city is seeing growth when it comes to talents that are, that are uh, staying in the community? Is, has this been working? Well, I, I was disturbed one time, Dean Rashani gave some figures, and I think we retain mm -hmm. maybe 60% of NDSU graduates. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a chapter with the different business partners do an internship. Yes. So for you, if you're able to do an internship at some company, you might be more inclined to look for opportunities within the community. And what we've touted is if you do internships, oftentimes the students will stay on and be partners in your, co in your company. And so one of our pushes is internships. Let's do internships throughout the community so people can find out what the job's about. Mm -hmm. And let's say you take an internship and it, it doesn't turn out, you don't like it or it's not the job you want. Well, you've learned that, mm -hmm. but that's good to know. But oftentimes for a business, if they can retain you mm -hmm. and they have a job opening, you've taken an internship there, they already know you're a good employee. They already know you'll fit in the subculture of that company. So I think that what we need to do is to get more and more students to stay to see it show them the opportunities in the mm -hmm. community. Wonderful. So what, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment, accomplishments, both as a mayor and as a doctor? <laughs> That's kind of hard because, you know, it was kind of like when we got the diversion finally funded, which is three point billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That was a huge huge success, okay. but it's almost like you, okay, that's done, what are we gonna do next? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, downtown, if you look at downtown block nine, all the things that have come downtown. Yeah. So when I started in 205, the property values downtown are 150 million. Mm -hmm. Property values in downtown Fargo right now are 1.3 billion. Wow. So accomplishment is to see all that growth and development, but yet at the same time, you see the growth in the city. Mm -hmm. So in 10 years, we've grown by 20%. So in 2010 to 2020, we've grown 20%. That's a huge accomplishment yeah. to be an attractive city that wants people to come in. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. So we're going to take another break here. When we come back, we'll ask the mayor about some of the challenges that he faces in the city of Fargo. We'll be right back.
All right, we are back. We are at the Vice and Information Network studio at NDSU. Today's guest is Mayor Timothy ben, uh, Mahoney. This is professional lunch, and now we're going to talk about the challenges. This is my favorite part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the biggest challenge that you face as the mayor of the city of Prague? Our challenge right now is uh, housing, basically, mm -hmm. and, and affordable housing, what type of housing you want, what you're going to grow. Okay. So in our community, we're about 55% apartments. We're 45% single-family homes or housing. And some cities are actually 60, 70 percent homeowners and 70 or 30 percent apartments. There's a housing study we're doing that's going to go over this year that we're going to figure out what do we need. And it's called workforce housing, affordable housing, low income housing. What do you need? Mm -hmm. So in the community, we have two bumps that I call the double bubble is you have the young people because we're average age of 32 years of age. And then you have the older bubble, which is 65 and older. So the 65 and older are looking for very affordable housing or apartments or what they need. So you need to take care of that. Yet the young people also are looking for affordable housing as they go through their job career and changes. Mm -hmm. So the challenge with the housing studies, we will find out what we need. If I put up a low income senior housing, it'll fill immediately. I have people fill those right away because they're on a fixed income and they want to know what the costs are. <clears throat> So we need to work with the state, the feds, try to figure out the best way to keep that affordable. The second part of that is when we have housing and where do we put it? So downtown, we're gonna have 5,000 people move downtown and we're starting to build more and more apartments. If you go down to those apartments, they're, to my mind, a little bit moderate range pricing. You know, if you pay over $1,000 for a single bed, bedroom, apartment at me, my mind gets a little pricey, mm -hmm. but you hope they have a job that reflects that they can manage that. But we're getting a downtown population neighborhood that's starting to develop, and we're getting a, a, a you know a greenfield area where we have less that. So it's trying to find the balance of that that works best for your community. And or if you have big population centers in different parts of your town to have the amenities that they may want in those areas. Mm -hmm. For instance, in South Fargo, when we're doing our uh, land code development is what it's called, we've been doing a study on that to find out what we need in the growth of the city. Because the diversion will define how big the city will get, we have to look at every acre of land very carefully. What will we put here? Where will the school go? Where would we put a, a different type of, of uh, uh, fire station? Where do I put my different utility issues? So you begin to look at the city as a long-term plan and we're long and narrow. So you really carefully have to look at all the land you have. And I loved it because Davies High School area, they were gonna put some more residential in the neighborhood. We got enough neighbors right now. We need stop and go or something else where we can get a quart of milk. So you begin to look carefully at what is commercial, what is residential, how will we make that? The third element is safety is you gotta look at your materials, fire trucks, how they can get to those locations. So I think the challenge the city will face is uh, land growth development, hopefully it'll be close to finish next fall or in the next, early in the spring, is that will help define what happens in our community. The be next best neighborhood that you're gonna see is by Walmart South in, in 52nd Avenue and there's Lake Fargo. I think you're gonna see how does that develop because this has an opportunity to be a great neighborhood, to put some uh, commercial type buildings in there parks in there, different elements that will make it one of those walkable, bikeable communities that will be, oh, I'd, I'd really like to live in that area. So I think that's what we, the challenge is, is that as the city grows, because you won't get a redo on that, you have to figure out how it best grows. And, and, and you know, sometimes you don't want rows and rows of apartments. I mean, rows and rows of apartments, there's a lot of people, big population, but what is it gonna be in 20 years? So every action you take now is always have to be thought about what's it gonna be like in 20 or 30 years. And we're 150 years old as a city, but when you go out east, there are cities of around 200, 300 years. And sometimes as you walk around a block and see something, you go, why would they ever have done that? I mean, that's the stupidest place to have this particular thing, right? Yeah. So we wanna be well, proactive and think, what would be smart to put in here? And let's pretend it's gonna be there for 50 to 100 years. Let's build in mind that it may be there for another 50 years, 60 years. So let's try to be thoughtful about how we do that. So I think what you need to do is, is thoughtfully think how your city grows. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. So with that, is housing your biggest priority right now uh, on this in this term as a year? Housing is one of my biggest things, but the other element is uh, what I always call sustainability. Mm -hmm. How do you make the community sustainable so I don't always have to increase taxes? How, how do we make it so our revenue stream comes in in a good, proper fashion? The other issue is social elements, the social fabric of the community. So we have to figure out how we make it that we can live together with each other and uh, tackle the problems we have. We have homelessness. We have, how do you handle that? How do you handle those people? Housing first, you try to get people into housing. So I think our challenges as a community is you need to look at your whole community, rich, poor, uh, mental illness, all the different elements, and how can we work holistically together so we are a healthy community. So Fargo is termed as one of the healthiest communities in the United States, we're third healthiest, also third happiest. <laughs> yes, but we have to look at how our social fabric is going to work mm -hmm. so you can feel comfortable walking anywhere in Fargo and feel comfortable that you will be okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to make it a safe environment for people, but also where we take care of each other. So I think that people have to think long term. Because if you have a neighbor you fight with, then daily, it's really difficult, right? Yeah, I mean, too. you have that irritating neighbor all the time. Mm -hmm. If you can get along with the neighborhood and we both look out for each other, so when we had the downtown riot uh, two years ago, the most refreshing thing about that was the next morning, neighbors from all over Fargo came and cleaned it up. Mm. And they brought their brooms and dust mops. And I mean, they, they brought dust pans. They brought what they had and just cleaned up the glass, cleaned up everything. But it was a, a outcry of the community is we take care of our community. We want it to heal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the, a real element of the community is, is let's work together and let's work out a way in which we could all be uh, happy in this community. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you have on your agenda for um, this term? The other things we have to look at is the Fargo Dome needs a major facelift. I think the Fargo Dome, for what people enjoy nowadays, we need to uplift it, make it a better, uh, better venue mm -hmm. uh, item. Uh, people always wanted us to do a convention center. Let's tackle that and figure it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, performing arts is let's work with NDSU and all the different campuses and universities and see if we can do something that, that that's iconic as well mm -hmm. and make it so we all all can enjoy it. And I think that 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 truly can can help us to the arts and culture and how you do that, because that's a big part of your community as well. Mm -hmm. So the big projects I want to look at are those different elements. OK, wonderful. So now we get to the point. So I get a, a question from the Bison Information Network Studio. <laughs> and then they have a question for you. And they're asking, the Fargo master plan um, is over 50% completed. What is still yet to be done to make it 100%? So what they have to do with the Fargo plan is the land code development looks at all elements of your community. And we just finished our in-focus study and they just came back and gave a five-year update on that. What that has to do is it how you zone, what you do. Do you put businesses in the neighborhood? Do you put commercial next to this or where else do you put those? So we're 50% down, but now we have to complete up what does the community want? Mm -hmm. So we need more input from the community to hit the needs of the community and what they think are the best uh, priorities for our community. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be closer to done uh, next fall okay. once we get those elements in there. So if you're asked, participate. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because that was going to be the next uh, question. Is there a target date for it to be 100%? So next fall. Next fall, we'd like to try to do that. But it's really important for people to engage because that's the only way we can find out what's going on. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, um, any... We get to the point where we want to hear what is some more advice you have for a uh, student that are in the school right now that will be watching this at some point. So <coughs> what are some of the professional advice that you have for them? My professional advice would always be a student, always learn, always try to learn from people. Mm -hmm. Never miss an opportunity to meet or talk to somebody who's been successful and learn from them. I always will go to a conference and hope I bring three things back. If I bring three things back, then it's been successful. So I would say, Always be a learner, try to find out and learn things. And what's kept me fresh and refreshed is always listening and talking to other people mm -hmm. and finding out uh, different things that also made them successful. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to engage and uh, make it so that you have an enriched life and enjoy what you do. Wonderful, wonderful.
Now we are so glad, Mr. Mayor, we are so glad to have you here with an unprofessional lunch, and we are really grateful for your presence. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Now, this is the part that I tell you. It's up to you to make today a great day. Have a great day.